let's get started. So I want to welcome everyone uh, to the uh, to tonight's program, uh, which is part of the Patterson Museum Foundation's lecture series uh, online on Zoom. Uh, the Patterson Museum Foundation, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we're a 501c3 nonprofit that supports the Patterson Museum itself. And that takes the form of these kind of lectures tonight, takes the form of equipment that we purchased for the museum. We've purchased, purchased art, artifacts. We're actually on the verge of purchasing another portrait painting for the museum and programmatic issues and all sorts of things. So we we uh, have fun helping the museum uh, sort of get out to more into the public and do good things for everybody. So we want to thank you all uh, for coming tonight. At the end of the program, you'll see a link to our PayPal uh, account. If you feel so inclined to actually give us, um, uh, provide a donation to us, we'd really appreciate it. And again, we are tax exempt. And so we want to thank you uh, for that, as well as, of course, coming for tonight. Uh, my name is Glenn Corbett. I'm the president of the foundation. And, um, you know, we've got we've had an, we have an exciting series that we've had for the last year and a half. For those of you who don't know, tonight's program, as well as previous programs, we do post them a few days later in the YouTube channel uh, for the Patterson Museum. So any of you who uh, have friends who missed it tonight and would like to see it, uh, they can log in and, uh, and do that. Sorry for the phone in the background here. Um, so that's what happens when you broadcast from your house. So, any case, um, hold on one second. Let me just get past that. I can't get to the phone. That's the problem. It's in another room. So, anyway, uh, again, sorry for that interruption. So, tonight's program is going to be uh, the topic specifically, and the title is Patterson's Forgotten Automotive Industry, the story of Everett Abbott Cooper. And we have an esteemed colleague of ours tonight, Michael Gabriel, who is going to provide the presentation to us tonight. Some of you may remember him. Uh, he's probably most famous for diners. Okay, that's probably his signature, um, his signature project that uh, that he's worked on. The the books, the exhibits, and all those things. He had one actually up at the Passaic County Historical Society uh, several years ago that some of you may have attended. So. What do we know about Mike? Well, Mike basically is, and again, a published author. He now has five books. Uh, the most recent, Mike, is, I believe, is on the Taverns of New Jersey. Well, no, uh, Taverns and, of New Jersey. Exactly. He's a mm -hmm. 1975 graduate of Montclair State University. And he has worked as a journalist and a freelance writer uh, for more than 40 years. He's a member of the Executive Committee of the Nutley Historical Society and serves on the advisory board of the Clifton Arts Center, which... Uh, is right around the corner from the museum. So uh, we want to thank him tonight. And uh, Michael, I'll turn over the microphone to Mike. Okay, so here we go. So thank, thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you to the um, Patterson Museum Foundation for hosting the program and inviting me. I appreciate it. Thank you to everybody who's on Zoom tonight for tuning in. That's very nice. Um, yes. <clears throat> My, uh, my topic tonight is Patterson's Forgotten auto Automotive Industry. And um, Patterson is, over the years, has been very famous, going back even to Alexander Hamilton days, as being a real industrial hub for New Jersey and really for the country in, in the early years. Um, it's well known for uh, the Colt 45 and for building locomotives and its, its industrial complex uh, with the with the silk industry and the, and the Patterson Falls, but um, not much that I that I could find actually was ever said about uh, the automotive industry. And yes, New Jersey had an automotive industry in Patterson, and actually and elsewhere too. We were there was a prayer, there was a period where we were building cars, um, pretty remarkable actually. So um, I knew about Everett Abbott Cooper from my diner books because the research I did and the family members, the Cooper family members I met, they were all very helpful. And uh, the uh, Silk City Diners, which were built in Patterson, that was a division of the Patterson Vehicle Company. But then the question is, okay, so now I know about diners. Well, what about the Patterson Vehicle Company? Where, where did that come from? And how did that start? And, and we were really making cars here in Patterson? Uh, the answer is yes. And um, 
I'll, uh, I'll provide you with some information. Uh, the story really centers on Everett Abbott Cooper. And uh, what a man, an entrepreneur, uh, very involved in politics in his day. And, uh, and there he is, nice straw hat. And, uh, that's, that's him. So uh, he was born in Suffern, New York, not too far from the New Jersey northern border, May 11, 1860. Suffern was a very small community at that time, just a little over a thousand people. Um, he actually came from a family of businessmen. There was a man named Dennis Cooper who bought a, a gristmill and sawmill in Suffern in 1814. And that was taken over by, I guess, his son and maybe Everett Abbott Cooper's grandfather or father. And so there's an example of how the Cooper family was involved with industry way back when. Uh, Everett Abbott Cooper, he graduated from, from high school, 1878, and entered the Centenary Collegiate Institute, which I guess is Centenary University now in Hackettstown, uh, still around. He was studying to be a, a Methodist mis minister, but after two years, he changed his mind. He said he decided to want to go into business. He, uh, he got married and had five, six sons, and they would all become vice presidents in the family business. Um, in those early days, not only was he involved, it was an entrepreneur and a businessman, he was very interested in uh, suffering politics. Um, he won an election in November of 1895 to become an, a canvasseer. And of course, I had to Google what that was. And that's a person who oversees uh, and monitors and verifies, certifies local elections. So uh, he became the Suffern Village President, which I guess is comparable to a mayor. And he served from 1898 to about 1901. And he probably also served on the Rockland County Assembly. Um, he got into the business, the, the, the wagon business, by uh, he had some personal connections with the Cortland Wagon Company, which is farther upstate New York. He probably worked there. Um, he probably did some business with them. And then, um, and then in 1886, when he was about 26 years old, he founded his own wagon business in Suffern. 1886. One of the questions I always had and didn't really know. Okay, so he's in Suffern. He starts his business, Suffern Wagon Company, 1886. When did he come to Patterson? Well, I never knew the answer to that question, but in looking at uh, old newspapers, the uh, Patterson Evening News, he came to Patterson around the year 1889. There was a page one story in the uh, December 20, 1893 edition of the Patterson Evening News and it was a feature article about Mr. Cooper and his business. And it the, 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 the story went on about, about four years ago, the Patterson Wagon Company began in this city. So if my, my math is correct, uh, I hope it is, that would be 1889. And um, he had, they were, they were making wagons. They also made wagon accessories too, harnesses, blankets, robes whips and wagon furniture these wagons they were like they were like uh, like like upholstered uh sofas they were uh leather leather seating and they were quite quite beautiful um the patterson evening news uh uh in a later on reported that he was doing quite well the businesses was go was doing doing fine his uh, main the main store or or showroom as it were was at 257 Market Street. And uh, apparently that a lot of people knew about it. Um, the, the uh, Now let's see. Oh, I'm, I'm falling behind on my images. So maybe uh, we got every Adam Cooper. Uh, uh, Heather, how about the Cooper family shot? There's, there, there's the executive board right there. <laughs> uh, this, is a, this is an amazing picture. And then uh, images four and five. There's a, there's a, those are Patterson vehicles, uh, Patterson wagons, and these are advertisements. And uh, 
really quite nice products. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a logo from uh, from the business. Uh, he's in Patterson, and you can see that the date is 1896. So that's a that's a pretty good indication. Um, on the logo, you can see that he he did business with carriages, business wagons, horse goods, and bicycles. He he uh, they were a sales agent for selling bicycles, and uh, I guess he thought that this diversity was good for competition for him. There were there were many wagon builders in New Jersey in this period, uh, in Trenton, in uh, Elizabeth, and Newark, and probably some other towns as well. So the wagon business was was quite widespread, very very competitive, and these were these were wagons, these were horse drawn wagons that were used for municipal purposes, for fire departments, for police departments, for businesses that wanted to transport goods, and uh, and for farms, and uh, and just I suppose there was a it must have been a, something of a status symbol where you had a a beautiful carriage that uh, sat in your uh, outside your home so. Uh, so he did. He was quite successful in his business. Um, Horse-drawn lunch wagons, and this sort of harks back to uh, to my diner books. Uh, diners <clears throat> and today's food trucks, they both have a common ancestor, and that's um, that's the lunch wagon, and that that was a horse-drawn wagon specifically built for food distribution on the street. And uh, so uh, that those wagons, that's really those really were the, that's the ancestral origins of the diner business. So what image are we up to now? Six and seven. Um, uh, this I love this picture. Uh, well, jumping ahead a little bit, but as you can see now, this is a this is a truck, and I I love the the logo, uh, wagons, automobiles, painting, repairing, trimming, trimming the Patterson Vehicle Company. Um, when did when did he decide to get into business with the so-called horseless carriage? Uh, again, I didn't know that until I was doing research. Well, he started. Uh, he diversified again, kept the kept the kept the wagons, horse-drawn wagons, but he got into uh, he got into he got into vehicles, cars, and 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 buses and trucks around uh, February 1901. And again, the Patterson Evening News on a page one story said that. Plans have been drawn up for a large new building to be erected at the rear of the Patterson Wagon Company on Market Street. The new structure will be used exclusively for the automobile department of that progressive firm. And they sold steam, gasoline, and electric vehicles. Now that's, think about that, electric vehicles. And there was back in those early days of the 1900s, there was a demand for electric vehicles, um, and they used uh, Thomas Edison's uh, batteries, the nickel iron alkaline batteries. And from what I read, you could get almost 100 miles on one charge. Now, everybody's talking about electric vehicles nowadays, but electric vehicles were were prominent and 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 part of the uh, the mix way back over to over 100 years ago, and. Uh, the the, uh, the vehicles that that he sold at his at his showroom came from New York, the Ward Electric Automobile Company. So he became a sales agent for there. Is the next next slide? Does that show the electric vehicles? I think so. Ah, here. Now, look closely. It's these are these are really cool vehicles. They're boxy, but what's missing? There's no engine in front because it's run by a battery. Both is both, both the, uh, I guess, uh, I guess, trucks that would deliver provisions and uh, so uh, 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 bakeries were especially keen on on electric vehicles because they didn't want their baked goods, their breads, their cakes, their pies to be fouled by gasoline fumes. They preferred to have their deliveries done with with electric vehicles. And so here they were selling electric vehicles in Patterson and making bodies for uh, gasoline vehicles. And uh, so this is, Patterson had a, had a automotive industry way back when. Um, 
the Patterson, the Great Patterson Fire, February 1902. Apparently, the Patterson Wagon Company survived that fire, although it did cover 26 blocks and, and burned or damaged over 450 buildings. Uh, there were estimates of, of uh, damage at the time of $10 million, which is probably in the billions today. So, uh, but as bad as the fire was, there were 100 people homeless, but the newspaper account said that only two deaths were directly linked to the fire. And that's uh, two deaths. I mean, I'm sorry, sorry for the two people who died, but that's pretty amazing. So after the, uh, after the Great Fire, the Patterson Wagon Company had fallen into hard times. Uh, business was not going well. They filed for bankruptcy, and that, uh, that was recorded in a September 30, 1905 article in the New York Times, and also covered in the Patterson newspapers as well. But we have to, we, you, have to, you have to look at the bankruptcy filing in the context of what was going on back in those days. So a lot of things must have been disrupting business. Uh, there was the silk worker strikes in 1902 and 1913, created a lot of uh, social and uh, economic upheaval in Patterson. Uh, the United States was just at the very end of a Great Depression, which uh, included the famous stock market panic and probably started the end of the infamous Gilded Age. So there were there were extenuating circumstances. There was a there, there was a lot of tension and a lot of disruption in the economic environment back in those days. But a year later, 1906, they came out of they came they came out of bankruptcy. Uh, and over the years, Mr. Cooper was very proud. He repaid all the all the debts that he owed. And so uh, now they were really going to start going into building automotive bodies for, among other companies, the Ford Company. And uh, let's see the trucks. Um, now members of members of the the Cooper family, who I've gotten to know over the years, <clears throat> how did they do this? How did they build? automotives in Patterson. Well, uh, I was told that some of those sons that you saw in the picture uh, a few a few slides ago, they would take the train to Detroit and they would drive back to Patterson with these uh, bare chassis. And Heather, we got a slide for that, I think. Uh, well, that's the truck. They, they, they drove several of these back to Patterson. And so while the Patterson Vehicle Company did not build engines and they didn't build the, the, the chassis and the structure, they did build the bodies for trucks and buses and cars. And that was the business. And um, and they were and they specialized in it. And again, they specialized in uh, custom auto bodies. The thought the thought never really never really sunk in, but car car manufacturing in those very early days. That was a custom production operation. Um, trucks, cars, buses, they were built to specification to what the customer wanted. They were built individually and you could have it in whatever color you wanted or whatever design you wanted. And uh, that was vehicle production back then. Um, but then what happened? Mr. Ford invented the assembly line. And I have a picture of that as well. We can move to that one, Heather. The assembly. All right, that. Oh, all right, go back a minute. So just go back one. This was the pat. This is the Patterson uh, Wagon Company. As you can see, they're making individual auto bodies to to various specifications. This was inside the plant. Not an automated system. It was a. It was a. It was a, a very much a hand built operation. Go to the next slide. Now you can see, this is a. This was actually a, a public domain picture. Now, Mr. Ford had the idea of having assembly line production of cars. And uh, I read from the uh, Ford website that the assembly lines, they, they cut the time to build a car to about 90 minutes compared to what was the industry standard of hand-built cars of about 12 hours. So, I mean, the economic uh, advantages are they're just, they're enormous. They're just quite, quite obvious. Um, although not everybody was very happy with doing line work like this. 
Um, I read an article in Smithsonian Magazine where uh, many people who are in this industry up until the advent of the assembly line, these the a lot of the workers, a lot of the companies, they felt that this was this was really not the way to do it. They 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 resented the fact that this was this was being automated this way. They said that it took away from the uh, from the custom built craftsmanship that they they had when they were building cars and trucks. I suppose it did, but the uh, the economic advantages were just were just too great. Um, and so during this time, during World War One, uh, Patterson they continued to do auto bodies, but the work for for cars and trucks just kept getting lighter and lighter. Uh, the demand was slack. The the, the the assembly line took up a lot of business. What they did do, they they would do. Uh, they still did a little bit of customization and they did repairs. So they had they still had cars and trucks operating operations in the plant, but now um, they would soon turn the business over to diner manufacturing. Uh, I should mention that during the World War II years, uh, the U.S. government redeployed manufacturing operations in Patterson at the Patterson Vehicle Company. They were used to uh, build vehicles that would trans that would transport uh, uh, aerospace uh, aerospace components and 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 uh, and 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 and, and, and uh, things from the um, from the Wright Patterson uh, Aeronautical Corporation. Um, it was right after World War One that uh, one of the sons, one of the vice presidents, William Cooper, he had this idea to explore diner manufacturing. <clears throat> uh, diners were just starting to come into their own in the United States as a really as a cultural icon and as a business. And uh, Jerry O'Mahony was probably the great grandfather of the diner business in, in, in the lunch wagon business in New Jersey. Lunch wagons actually started up in Providence, Rhode Island. And then as the lunch wagons get getting bigger and bigger and more popular and more popular, you no longer needed to uh, to be mobile. You didn't have to have the, the wagons transported by by horses anymore. You could have you could be at a set location. And so again, set location, you had bigger and bigger wagons. Soon the wagons evolved into what we know today as as diners. So uh, that was that was William Cooper. And um, Les Cooper, uh, one of the descendants of uh, Patterson Vehicle Company, he told me that the development of the diners or the dining car, uh, there was there was a uh, there was an idea that uh, the Patterson Vehicle Company could could improve those early diners and lunch wagons because of its experience in auto body production. They could transfer or re redeploy that. Uh, that uh, that that experience into diners and, and wagons. 1924 is when they started doing uh, lunch wagon and diner prototypes, and then by 1906, uh, that's when they really started commercial production of uh, Silk City diners built by the Patterson Vehicle Company, um, and that then really became, and there we have the. We have the, the 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 plant now. If you look way over on the left hand side, very small, in the window there, you can see uh, Patterson Vehicle Company bodybuilders. So uh, that's uh, that's this was the plant where they were they were doing things. So diners diners started to come of age in the late nineteen twenties. Mister Cooper, Everett Abbott Cooper, he died on January fourth. 1953, at his home on Duran Avenue in Patterson. He was 92 years old. And the company went on. The uh, The sons kept running the businesses, building, uh, doing car car manufacturing and uh, and repairs. But really, the diner business is really what, what became the big, the big uh, profit center for the Patterson Vehicle Company. Um, up until... Um, the, the mid 1960s, um, the diner business was really starting to fade. New Jersey was really the diner manufacturing capital of New Jersey. We had many, many diner builders here in New Jersey. 
And these are diners that were built in a factory, modular, prefabricated, with all the utilities, everything built in. It was a turnkey operation. They even included cups and saucers and silverware with the diners, the Silk City diners that were sold. And this was a very pop profitable business. But things started to slow down. Um, the fast food restaurants started to come to New Jersey and to the East Coast. And of course, that did cut into business. A lot of the diner builders were fading, were going out of business. And that also hit the Patterson Vehicle Company and the Silk City Diner Division. Uh, so by, uh, by 1964, production ceased, and then they liquidated all the assets and all the all all the all the uh, all the operations and the equipment that they had. Patterson, as an automotive place, actually had the, there were there were other things that that were uh, that were going on in the city, namely, midget car races at Hinchcliffe Stadium beginning in the early 1930s, and midget cars. Midget car phenomenon started on the west coast. And soon crossed over to the East Coast, and the, oh, there's a there's a go back there's a that's that was a, a a diner diner flyer there. I mean, look at that thing; it's beautiful. And no, these are like this is part of Americans America's production legacy. They, they, nobody ever built things like this before. <clears throat> so now go ahead to the next slide. So you had midget car racing at Hinchcliffe Stadium, and here's a midget car. It's basically four wheels and a big engine. <clears throat> uh, these things could go very fast and it was an open cockpit. They were very, very dangerous, but you had to be a daredevil to race. <clears throat> now, I believe this picture shows uh, one of the legendary places in Patterson where, the, where these uh, were, 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 were car mechanics and drivers where they 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 really their part of their corner of the city was a place called Gasoline Alley, and it's sort of taken on legendary status. Um, I guess this must be on Gasoline Alley. Uh, it's it's a dirt road; it's not paved. I can, uh, I can tell you that. And these were where all the uh, all the all the garages and where all the uh, all the uh, the blacksmiths and where all the mechanics worked, uh, metalworking operations. Um, there were a lot of, uh, and this is where the drivers would uh, either before or after a race this was their this was their hangout this is where they went this was their this was their social gathering spot and according to the newspaper articles i saw the gasoline alley tavern which is on which was on 838 market street that was the place that was where i guess you maybe there was like uh maybe you had to be like a, a driver of a certain of a certain rank to get in but uh, that was that was really the place where 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 the drivers and all and all all the people associated with uh, with car racing, um, that's where they hung out. And uh, Hinchcliffe Stadium also had motorcycle races and even stock car races, but um, that stopped in the mid 1950s, I believe. And so uh, that's when uh, so then so now the 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 automotive part of Patterson's. Uh, industrial profile basically went away. The Patterson Vehicle Company was still doing some repairs, but ma mainly their business now was diners. Um, in New Jersey, outside of Patterson, I found out that there was also um, automotive manufacturing. In fact, major automotive manufacturing. <clears throat> um, the Ford Company, uh, they had a plant in Edgewater, and I've seen pictures of it. You can find it online. And this, in the time, it was one of the largest car manufacturing facilities in the United States, as big as Detroit. And that's pretty amazing. Uh, they closed that operation in uh, 1955, and trans and Ford transferred the operation to Mawa. And uh, that plant employed about 5,000 workers. But again, Ford decided to terminate the operation July 1979. Uh, in a Bruce Springsteen song, he talks about they closed down the auto plant in Mawa late last month. So that's uh, he he immortalized that. 
General Motors also had a vehicle assembly plant in Linden. It opened in 1937, closed in, uh, in 2005. So quite amazingly, New Jersey had an automotive industry and the hub was Patterson. So there's a couple of, I want, it was just, we had so many great pictures we came upon. I, I wanted to just include these at the end, Heather. So if you can show those. <laughs> Again, this is a, this is an electric vehicle. I think. To me, these things are like, these are like something, they're, they're like modern, the way they look, they, the way they were designed. Beautiful, beautiful. So this, this was an electric vehicle. And the next one, now this is a fire truck, gas powered, of course, you can see the engine. But again, I love the, I love the, the, uh, the building facade, the Patterson Vehicle Company. That's, that's why I like this, this picture very much. So there's a few more, I believe there was a bus. Now look at this thing. This is like, this is like something out of a, out of a movie from the, from from just last year. This is a, this is, this is a very very interesting and very very innovative design that the, that they had here. So this was a bus, and uh, maybe to to end the program, we'll show you the logo. Oh oh, not let's not forget, <clears throat> who is building all these things at the Patterson Vehicle Company? Who is making diners? Who is make who are doing the auto bodies? Well, here they are, guys like this. These were skilled craftsmen. These were men who knew how to work with metal, who knew how to, who, they were carpenters, they were electricians, they were plumbers, they were pipe fitters. They knew how to do all these things. And so they, they, they worked on vehicles, they did the auto bodies, and then, and then that, that manufacturing, that, those manufacturing methods were transferred to building diners. So... And I think the last one is the logo. Patterson Vehicle Company founded 1886, manufacturers of Silk City Diners. So, so with that, I will say thank you very much. Thank you for listening. And um, I'd love to see questions that you might have in the, in the chat. So Glenn, are you gonna take that away for me? Yes, uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Michael, for your presentation tonight. Um, for those, excuse me, have questions, uh, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Move your mouse down to the bottom to see Q&A. Just type a question in there and we'll we'll ask him. Yes, and so uh, back in the day, um, I'll start it off uh, um, to uh, bring up a couple things, uh, Michael. So, you know, the need for, for wagons was immense, right? That's why there were so many of them manufacturers yes. across the country because to some extent just every local community relied upon them to move goods and things and people and what have you Big uh, demand, one of the yeah. other other um notable um wagon makers was an i ironically um uh disappointing company name of sour butt uh <laughs> who uh was also uh in patterson making wagons at the same time and okay. um they uh as you point out the, you know if you think about it back then um you know for for centuries wagons that existed in one form or another it's not until we get to the automobile era that um you know the motorized vehicles that we get to that but but patterson did have a have a long history of of automotive um you know uh, automotive industry particularly when it came to equipment and specific things that were built into automobiles and of course we all know uh, about mm -hmm. the um situation with um uh with aeronautical equipment right with right aeronautical and patterson locomotive so there was yep yeah. so there, there was lots of um skilled workers i guess we could say who yes really were were particularly well suited for you know bigger industries and of course we know how much that meant to um uh to the uh to the city uh we have a couple questions here uh from dave ferrari is actually our um our secretary for the pmf he asked a question uh he thanked you uh mike for your presentation and he asked that they make lots of fire apparatus a lot of fire trucks we saw the nyack uh engine on there uh, a minute ago 
So, um, you know, one of the, Mike, do you want to just talk about uh, for a moment about the Patterson Museum's collection of photographs? Why don't you talk about that and maybe get a sense of what, how many fire apparatus you saw there? There, were, Heather, Heather came upon this amazing stash of these beautiful glass negative photographs from uh, back in the day. And she mentioned the name of the photographer who she believes might have taken them. Uh, I guess he must be a noteworthy guy. But uh, these these glass negative photographs are are stunning. And if you ask me, I I, I don't know that the that today's digital cameras can even match the level of detail that, that they have. So there's an amazing collection of photographs that the foundation has that, that she shared with me. Um, it was tough to pick out certain pictures. I tried to, I tried to think, well, I can't, I can't go overboard. So I tried to, I just tried to gear the, the photos to the, to, to the commentary that I was giving in the, in the zoom chat, but amazing that the, the pictures, and what's what's even more amazing is there'll be a picture of a car or fire a fire truck, but then look at the background. It's this is the this is Patterson. This is the city of Patterson in the early 1900s. These are these are little time capsules. It's amazing what's what what's been captured in these pictures. So uh, I just I I was just I was just in awe of these photographs. Maybe we should. Uh, Maybe we should have a, a do a display of these one of these days. By the way, before I forget, I want to thank. Well, of course, I want to thank the, uh, the the museum foundation. I want to thank the uh, Cooper family, uh, Malcolm Cooper, Thomas Cooper, Les Cooper. Very very helpful, and I want to thank the wonderful people at the uh, at the Suffern Public Library. They were very helpful with providing me with information. Um, and then I got a lot of information from vintage newspapers uh, that I found, and then some things that I knew from just from my research with with the uh, with, with working on on the diner books and things like that. So thank you to all, thank you to all for for your help in doing this research. Very much appreciated. So maybe take the next question. Yeah, that lines up with the next question. Is um, you met with the Coopers, uh, yes. talked to them about their family business. I'm a, I'm an um, honorary they, member of the Cooper family. <laughs> okay, okay. Are they is any are any of them still involved with manufacturing some form of manufacturing, or is um, that uh, sort of uh, in their history at this it, point? It's in their history. Uh, Malcolm, who's up in Vermont, um, he's actually pretty handy uh, <laughs> uh, with uh, with tools. But uh, but no, after I think after the, the when the diner business. When they liquidated the diner business, there was there was no more, you know, Patterson Diner or Patterson Vehicle uh, manufacturing. It kind of ended with that with that second or third generation. So, uh, so yes, we uh, we in talking about the Cooper family, uh, I worked with Heather. Uh, we uh, she's a pleasure to work with, and back when she was at the uh, uh, the castle in Patterson, um, we did a diner presentation. 2015 and um it was a nice exhibit but the best thing about that exhibit was we didn't even realize it became a cooper family reunion so you got these six brothers and all these relatives and all these cousins and nieces and nephews they all came together there were there were a bunch of coopers there and a lot of them had never met each other before and they were first cousins so that that was uh that was really heartwarming that uh I I enjoyed that. That was I think that was my favorite part of that uh, that 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 exhibit at Lambert Castle. So uh, so three cheers to the Coopers. Exactly. Uh, Dennis asked the question: um, Are you aware of any of the actual vehicles uh, that the uh, um, company produced that are still actually in existence? Any of them restored? If, do we have a sense of any of them still uh, out there riding around somewhere? <laughs> Boy, if if there are, they must be very valuable. I don't know. I don't know if we have anything in the in the Patterson Museum. Uh, there there is a there's a we have a section on on fire equipment. I don't know if there's a, a truck there, but uh, you know they must be somewhere. I'm sure there's maybe like you know in a Smithsonian Museum or there there are a lot of industrial museums around the United States. Um, they do those for for early vehicles. They have there's they have them for bicycles. They have them for diners uh cars so 
I wouldn't be surprised if you could find it. I don't I don't know where a Patterson vehicle wagon or early car or truck would be, but uh, boy, it'd be nice to have it back in Patterson. That's for sure. And actually, I think, uh, Mike, we've got uh, sort of a reunion tonight. There's several Coopers on this uh, Zoom session. And uh, Malcolm Cooper has a comment. He just wanted to point out that uh, when the Cortland Wagon Company uh, declared bankruptcy, it dragged down the Patterson Vehicle Company as they were right. co-signers of the note, the financial note. Right. And um, the um, the patriarch, Mr. Cooper, actually had a heart attack, but he did rebound over it. So it was, uh, yeah. it was um, you know, unfortunate situation that, uh, you know, um, that occurred back then and things. But, you know, it's <clears throat> most people know the story of the Silk Sitter Diner, but they don't know the connection to the vehicle company. That's really where, it came, where they came from. Right. So yeah. that was a, yeah. it yeah. was an evolution uh, to the diners and we know those those diners still exist so that we know they, they they're do. still out yeah there. i can think of a couple of silk city diners that are still in operation in new jersey but then they again they're few and far between too but exactly yes yeah, so uh mr cooper lived to 92 he must have been a tough guy and yes he must have he had business business relations with the Cortland wagon company which in upstate new york so yes thank, thank you very much malcolm and uh karen uh karen p says thank you michael for the wonderful presentation my pleasure. Uh, James P. Um, the Mac Avenue production field is for Ford's first factory, which was rented. He then built his own building, the Paquette Avenue factory, it utilized a hybrid approach to vehicle construction. The Highland Park factory used the assembly line that we're familiar with today. So it's a little bit of Detroit uh, history uh, in there. Uh, these are Robert, places, these are places in New Jersey? Uh, no, these are all in Detroit. So these oh, okay. are all in Detroit um facilities as as um as ford sort of developed the concept the assembly line but we can't forget we're talking about patterson tonight too and although we some people will argue with this we do know that samuel colt yes the revolver colt mm -hmm. did develop a form of an assembly line um there at the factory we know that people know that. were actually contracted henry b crosby the father of Patterson's Park System actually was a contractor, a vendor, a 1099, uh, to Samuel Coat to produce specific components, uh, the triggers and things like that for the factory. So it was not a line of people putting all these parts together, but the parts were developed in mass and then they were assembled, basically. So we could argue that Patterson was actually the first place that <laughs> developed the concept of the assembly line so right, i'll, I'll, I'll throw that argument yeah, okay a, i'll take now you, that. now you really want to start an argument you know where did the uh, texas hot texas wieners start we say well Patterson, that's another but, one well the people in union county say no 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 started down here so uh well we could have arguments all day but anyway we let's, could let's on. we could allentown also claims that too but yeah, by the well, way um we good. still we're probably gonna have a, a hot texas wiener day this summer sponsored by the pmf we're still working on it uh, we tried to do it last year and weren't able to do it, but we're going to try to do one at the museum in July. So keep tuned for that going forward. We're actually going to try me, I'll it. come hungry. Okay, that's the thing. Um, and we'll have real hot uh, Texas wieners for sale, too. That's the point. Right. So, sure. Um, so uh, let's shoot over to the diners for a minute. Who are the diners' major competitors, and do any of them still exist? I guess Paramount, some of the others. You want to talk? You're the diner expert in New Jersey, so... <laughs> So who are the other companies that would have been competing with Silk City? Well, the, I, I would say the the big three or four would have certainly been Jerry O'Mahony. He started in Bayonne, and then eventually he got so much business, he had to move to a factory in Elizabeth. So Jerry O'Mahony, uh, the Coleman Company, K-U-L-L-M-A-N, <clears throat> they built wonderful diners. They started in Newark. <clears throat> they moved across the river to Harrison. And then eventually went out to uh, Lebanon in New Jersey. Uh, Silk City was probably number three. And then there were a lot of other big diner manufacturers. The Fodero Company was big. Uh, the Mountain View Company was big. At any given time in New Jersey, we had 15 to 20 diner builders. Some of them were very small. Some didn't last too long. Maybe just they just built four or five diners. And then we also had diner refurbishers. So I... I can, with pride, I can say that New Jersey, we're not only the diner capital of the world, 
<clears throat> in the 20th century, we were the diner manufacturing capital of the world. There was other manufacturing going on up in New England. Uh, Worcester, Massachusetts was a place where a lot of, a lot of early diners were built. Uh, there, were, there were diners being built in the Midwest, um, in New York. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, so that, but all, all the diner manufacturing companies, they all, they all went under. It's all, all, all extinct. No more, no more diner builders in New Jersey. And for the most part, <clears throat> there's maybe a couple of companies now in the United States that they, they sort of make components in a factory, but it's, it's not the same. Diners for the most part now <clears throat> are built on site, but they uh, they still utilize that modular prefabricated technology that they that they uh, they came up with. I see a questionnaire. Rosie's diner that was a Paramount company, another big diner builder. Paramount was in uh, your uh, your nearby suburb there of uh, of Halden. Pat Paramount was a big big diner company builder, uh, just like Fodero, like Mountain View. So quite a number of quite a number of diner builders. Yeah, and and Rosie's is actually. Was in the news recently a couple weeks ago that it's being resurrected once again. I heard that. Uh, I heard. I, that. I, I I could throw my own personal two cents. My mom actually worked at the record down the block when it was on Route forty, uh, Route um, forty six there in Little Ferry, and uh, she went there that morning. They closed basically. She and a couple of the ladies from the record went down there and were one of the last customers before it, of course, shut down. But now it's. It's being resurrected, thank goodness, and it's being moved and will be fixed up once again. So we'll have a new life in a new home. I'll, I'll right. believe it when I see it. Because it's, right. right. it's been sitting in some empty lot in Michigan for like the last 15, 20 years. It's very sad. That was a beautiful diner. I mean, let's, if you know, come on, bring it back to New Jersey. Why not? Well, I think it, I forgot. I, I read the article a week or two ago, and I forgot it. And someone will probably remember exactly where it's going to. But it was purchased already. Uh, husband I, and wife. I saw team. That, yeah, people yeah. posted on Facebook. Yeah. yeah. Let's hope that it we'll that it happens. We'll we have a comment uh, from James P. who says that as a child, he was actually in one of the gasoline alley garages when he was a youngster, and all he remembers it was very cramped and smelled of oil when he was there. So that's a okay. that's a good description, right? Surrounded um, by tough guys, right? Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Susan A. and I think I'm suspecting that Susan A um is a cooper family member and she says thank you very much michael you're an honorary member of their family um, yeah, she's up in, up in connecticut she's very nice right exactly wonderful person and james p also just posted a comment about rosie's we just discussed and yes paramount was in Halden. so yes. i think i've got one more question back over on the q a i'm going back for it between the two um uh okay I must be a rare bird, Malcolm Cooper says. Actually, Malcolm's got a couple of comments, so I'll read these here. He must be a rare bird that uh, he met his grandfather and visited the diner factory in the early 50s and my pre-teens. But I remember the sawtooth roof and lots of dust and noise. Now, I guess um, that was the factory. It was over on 27th Street, right, in 19th Avenue. Uh, was it 19th Avenue, I guess? It was a much more spread. So they've, as time went on, they grew they were on market, they built behind, and then they moved down market a little further, and then eventually they went over to 27th Street. And, and that's, that's probably that, the one yeah. he remembers. That letterhead right. that was the very last. Uh, yeah. It, 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 had, it shows the map of the Illustrated 19th and 27th, I think you said. Yes. It yeah. that and it shows a big sprawl of the factory. So that's. Yeah. That's, that's that was at their really height, I guess, at yeah. that point. Yeah. And then Mal Malcolm also says that it must be in the Cooper jeans. My dad, Malcolm Everett Cooper, ran the J. Keith. J.K. Adams Company for 50 years. We're celebrating our 80th year in business this year. My dad cashed in his share of Silk City Diner stock to buy J.K. Adams for $10 in 1949. So that's a very interesting comment. So Malcolm, Malcolm is a nice guy. He came down to Patterson. We met with him one day. Nice chap. Nice chap. And uh, they actually have a website, apparently. It's jkadams.com. So if anyone's mm -hmm. would like to go see about that particular company, that's sort of a legacy uh to the patterson vehicle company yes um take a look at that so uh i think i think that's it as far as the questions go um yeah from james p okay yep 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 so and again more thanks again for your presentation tonight this is a again i i this was interesting because particularly because 
Um, you know, a lot of people, again, know more about Silk City than they know about its predecessors and the vehicles and the wagons and things that actually were around for quite a while that, that the um, the Coopers were building, basically, and and the workers for the at the factory. Uh, very, very important to us. I, I just want to point out one other thing is that uh, Michael Michael identified or, or dis, uh, brought up the fact that the glass negative digital scans that um, that he used to pick out some of the photos tonight. Um, and we're happy to report, I think some of you know this, that the Museum Foundation, uh, along with some county grants and grants from uh, from the Brotherton uh, Foundation, have completed the all the glass negative digitizations. Thousands and thousands of photographs that were on glass now are digitally in an archive, which eventually, as time goes on, will become a little bit more accessible and people will be able to see it. But we completed all that, and we're now actually doing digitization of um, regular film, uh, four by five um, inch film negatives uh, from a later period of time, pretty much from the 40s up through the 70s. Wonderful. So, and then a 35 millimeter as well. So we're we're slowly digitizing all this with the goal of one day having these pictures available to folks. And um, it's a it's a wonderful thing. I mean, it's remarkable that that we're able to do this over the last couple of years. And um, and again, people are doing research in the future. will have the benefit of seeing all these photographs, not just the Patterson vehicle, but all the photographs. So great resource. That's that's really that's very good that that these things still exist because one of a kind. It's amazing. Exactly. That's exactly. the history. It's captured. It captures the history. Exactly. <clears throat> and so I, I, I think we're at a close tonight. It's just before eight o'clock. Uh, Michael, okay. again, I want to thank you for, for coming on tonight. My uh, I want to thank everybody for attending. The next lecture will be the lady behind the curtain here, um, Heather Garside. She's behind. If she wants to turn her screen on for a minute, here you'll see her again. Um, here she comes. She'll be actually talking about Jenny Tuttle Hobart. Yes. Uh, Garrett Hobart, vice president, who passed away in 1899. We missed the boat for having a person from Patterson become president of the United States. He's going to talk about uh, Garrett Hobart's. She's going to talk about Garrett Hobart's wife, who uh, played a big role in Patterson for many years after his death. She was very much involved with particularly philanthropic efforts on a variety of issues. Uh, she was very involved after the great fire that Michael mentioned in 1902, the great flood, which came a month after the fire, which literally the water came up right to the edge of the burnt district. So they basically came one month after another um, and donated so many objects and things to a variety of organizations. And of course, William Patterson University owes its headquarters to Jenny Tuttle Hobart. So, so Heather's going to talk about her in length uh, on March 5th. So um, for those of you who are here for the first time tonight, you're now in our email list and emails go out for each one of these lectures that we do. So just let us know that you want to attend and you will get a Zoom link as you did tonight. And um, again, we look forward to having you back again for a future presentation um, here on the Patterson Museum Foundation's webinar series. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Heather. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Take for care, everybody. Good night.